that'd be perfect. Thank you. And grab a seat, everybody. Good morning. Happy Sunday. As you can see, we have uh, all of our decorations up from Hanging of the Greens. Um, looks awesome. If you, uh, if you have a sister with Hanging of the Greens, would you stand up or put your hand up or something? Is anybody here? A couple? Kathy, you did it all by yourself? No. <laughs> no, awesome. It looks really good. It's, it's exciting to see the Christmas tree out there, the lights up. Um, anyway, I'm uh, Nick. I'm the youth pastor here at North Albany Community Church. I uh, just want to highlight a couple of things. First off, um, Christmas Eve is coming up quickly. We are two Sundays away. Two Sundays away. And so Christmas Eve actually falls on a Sunday uh, this year. Just to clarify, we are still doing morning services. It'll be pretty similar to what we do on the morning. We're going to uh, continue on through the Advent book. I think that's going to be faith that day. Um, and so we're still going to have our normal Sunday services. And then that evening, we'll be having our Christmas Eve service. Um, we'll be singing. We'll be telling the Christmas story. Um, we'll be doing the candlelight aspect. So that'll be going on Christmas Eve. So we invite you to come to both. Come to one of the services in the morning. And then come celebrate with us in the evening as well. Um, one of the things that we've been doing the past few weeks is highlighting the different ministries here and just we've had a pretty a pretty awesome 2023 along with a lot of the stuff that we're doing and that's thanks to all of our uh, people that serve and all the various ministries and so um, today we wanted to take time to thank um, a lot of the people who do some of the behind the scenes stuff um, and keep the facility going and things like that so if you help out with any of these if you wouldn't mind just standing up we'd love to to thank you for for all your service if you serve in uh, facilities working in the facilities if you serve on the property team if you serve on the prayer team, missions, finance, if you assisted with any special events like the bazaar, the um, trunk or treat, things like that, would you mind just standing up real quick? I know there's a lot of you. Don't be shy. Stand up. Awesome. 
we appreciate all the work that you put in, and, and we're grateful for that. And so um, we just wanted to take that time to recognize you. Uh, at this time, we are about to, about to have an awesome music presentation and, and worship that we're going to have. But at the, before we get started with that, stand up, greet one another, say hello, and we will continue to sing. Thank you. 
Good. Let's give them one more round of applause as they head out. <clears throat> awesome. All right. At this time, while the kids are leaving, the youth are going to come up for a spot. No, I'm just kidding. I just <laughs> wanted to see their eyes get big. Um, no, but what I would love for you to do, if you can pull out the communication cards in the chairs, uh, the seat backs, we'd love to take this time as we do every Sunday to make sure that we take time to, um, to give our prayer request up to the Lord. Um, as a church, we have teams that pray multiple times throughout the week and uh, lift these prayer requests up, lift these praises up. So I encourage you, whether you have a prayer request, whether you have a praise and God's been doing something awesome in your life, just take a moment to fill that out and, uh, and then we'll get uh, started with offering and uh, with our leading of the prayer. At this time, I'd like to invite uh, Dwight Wolf, who's going to lead us in prayer this morning, and also invite our ushers to come forward to take our, our morning offering. One of my favorite parts of our, our Sunday mornings is hearing from different people of our congregation that, that are here to lead us in prayer. Um, we're such a praying church, and so I, I love that we, we take the time to do this. So, Dwight, thank you very much. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we just come to you with uh, grateful hearts this morning, Father as uh, we enter in this season to celebrate the birth of your son. Father, as you sent your only son from separated from the Godhead to come to earth in human form, to take on all of the cares, the temptations, the worries, the struggles that we have so that you would know personally, we thank you for that. Father, can, may we count it all as joy as we enter into the third week of Advent, which is joy. Joy, Father, for you willingly coming to this earth for our, for us. Lord, I pray for the leadership of this church, for Pastor Tom, Pastor Dave, Pastor Nick. Lord, I pray for the elders. I pray for all of those who attend here, Father. Lord, in each one of us, we have our own things going on in our lives and our struggles. Lord, I pray that you manifest yourself in each person's life, Father, that they may see the work of your hand in their lives. Lord, we just count it all joy as we lift these prayers up to you. In Jesus Christ, I name, I pray. Amen. God's given me joy is uh, when I'm struggling with something or um, I just don't know what I'm gonna do or I, I just try and smile and be like you know what God's got me it doesn't matter what's gonna happen it doesn't matter if things don't make sense I'm like you know what 
I'm gonna just smile anyways because there are so many things that I could pull apart and be not thankful for or um, so many things that are going wrong that I could be like, yeah, that sucks. But uh, instead I just try and smile through because, you know, joy comes in the morning. So when I think of how God has uh, showed me joy or had me be joyful within uh, times when I shouldn't be, I think of the times when um, there's just some too many struggles to deal with, uh, when life is just super difficult, and yet there's times when um, I just find joy and comfort in God. Um, financial issues um, in college when I don't know uh, how I'm going to get by, but then uh, just finding joy in God and how He's just always remained with me and finding comfort with just having God by my side. Recently, um, I've really experienced what true joy is when it comes to being a dad and, and my son. When I open the door from, from work and he's there and he goes, Dad, Dad's home, and just runs to me with open arms and just seeing the smile on his face and the happiness, regardless of where he's at in that day, is just as pure and utter joy. And so that's always a reminder to me. God has given me joy in so many different areas of my life. Between hardships and the highs of my life, I have been able to find joy and thanksgiving to God for everything that I've been able to do. Hi guys, my name is Kylie Koontz and I think I find, I find joy in every day. I mean, there's always something to be joyful about. I especially find joy in my husband, um, just coming home to somebody I love. Um, but God has provided food and shelter and just having a home to go to is absolutely wonderful. Um, just find joy in coming to church on Sundays and seeing all my friends and family. And um, yeah, there's joy in everything. And the fact that I live in America is, is pretty great. So um, God definitely provides lots of joy and it's very, yes. So. <laughs>joy. One of the things that brings me great joy is to see kids singing Christmas carols and hymns and uh, beyond that that they are a part of our church family that is productive and beyond that that they stick around and uh, beyond that that they participate in ministry and it, some of you know um, my kids story and and my daughter happens to be one of our missionaries and we have another missionary going out this summer, so I'm going to ask Alexia to come on up and share a couple of words about her experience that she's about to get into. So come on up, Lex. Yeah, come on up. That's okay. You, I know you're completely unprepared, and that's all right. Pastor Tom, I came to church in my sweatshirt, and uh, just give it your best shot. Tell them what you're doing, where you're going, and all of that jazz. Oh, sure. I suppose we could do that. What, what are we, prepared? Is this, oh, she's got There we go. Okay. In January, I fly to Kentucky for three months. I'll be doing training there with YWAM. And then sometime in March, I will fly overseas, and I will go use my training and go spread the gospel. And, and you don't know where yet? Yeah, I don't know where yet. I'll find out in March. So, so that's during the, during the training time, they sort of evaluate, put you guys in teams and decide where you're going to go? Yes, correct. Cool, cool. Now, I, I suspect flying uh, it d isn't free. No, it's not. Okay. So how do you expect to get any money, Alexia? <laughs> Um, well, currently, I am only $200 away from my goal for tuition. Wait, wait. How much is tuition? Tuition is thirty six hundred. Thirty six hundred, and you're only two hundred dollars away. Yes. And and don't you have a table out there with some stuff on it? Uh, no, the... because I was not prepared. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I... Okay. Let me rephrase that. Aren't you going to stand by a table out there after the service? Yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> and and I could come out there and I could give you two hundred dollars or ten dollars or. Right. Yes. Correct. And that would go. That would that would help get you out of here and get you to Kentucky. Yes. Or no, wait, that's curriculum, right? That's for school. Yes, so the okay. 3600 is for school. Okay. Um, 
raising all the funds I need, and I'm actually currently fundraising for my outreach portion, which could be up to $5,000. Wow, okay, so that's a biggie. And you'll fundraise even while you're there. You'll continue to yeah. send out letters and let people know. Okay, yes. and you ha do you have your money for travel to get you there? I do. You yeah. do, so we can get rid of you pretty quick then. <laughs> I guess so. That is awesome. We want you out there. We want to get rid of you as fast as we can. So, so all together, how long are you going to be gone? I'm going to be gone for six months, possibly more. Wow, that's like, that's not two weeks. I mean, we've all done the, you know, go to Mexico, build a house two weeks thing, but I mean, I have this is fun. big. <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. Can I pray for you? You can. <laughs> Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for Alexia. We thank you for the, the step that she's taking to go and to uh, leave everything that's so familiar to her and to go out and to uh, train and to learn with other people. We pray for that time that it would be a relationship building time, that it would be a wonderful time of her uh, growing closer to you and uh, the steps that she's taking, Lord. We pray that they are uh, positive, that she continues to grow closer to you, not only in faith, in going, but Lord God, that you would train her up, that she would be effective as she goes out in the field. She doesn't even know yet where they're going to send her. It could be the southern hemisphere, it could be the northern hemisphere, it could be this side of the world or the other, but Lord, we know that you will be with her. You're a big God, and we trust you for that. We pray these things in, in Jesus' name. Amen. There we go. Okay. Good, Nick. Isn't that awesome? She was not prepared for that at all, but you know what? She's... she's She's taken a big step, and that's huge. Uh, maybe you, you've had the opportunity to take that step, and you've never done it. Well, maybe you think it's too late. I can't. How am I going to be a part of evangelism in, in the world? How am I going to? Well, there's a way. You can be a part of what Alexia's doing, and you can support her, and she'd probably really appreciate that. Um, you know, it, it really is great to see, as, as Nick said, and I think uh, Kylie mentioned it a little bit, uh, the idea of coming home and having somebody say, hey, welcome home, we're glad you're here. Maybe, you know, maybe you don't have kids. Maybe you've got a dog, and your dog greets you at the door. Yeah, dogs are good for that, right? <laughs> you know, they're sort of right there. It's so good to have that kind of a greet. And, and I, what I find is that people that go out on mission that are a part of doing something big like that, that's, that's sort of their response to God. When they see God working in their life, when they see God involved in everything they, they're doing, providing a way, being, you know, taking every step ahead of them, when God's involved in it, they're like, ah, God! <laughs> you know, and they're, they're excited. And they, and they see God's love, and they're, and they're so joyful because of it. Um, and, I, and I think probably that's what we think of when we, when we think of of joy, but let me ask you a couple of questions. Which one of these scenarios would bring you the most joy? You go through the drive through for your favorite coffee shop, you order your triple shot latte, soy, peppermint, mocha, in the fall I'm sure it has some sort of pumpkin in it, and you get your whip on it and you discover that the car in front of you paid for your drink. Hold on, that's choice number one. Number two, you wake up on Christmas morning and you find that it snowed four inches overnight and now you have to shovel it. That's number two. Number three, your child or your grandchild makes you some Christmas cookies and, and a homemade card. Or maybe, number four, you water your Christmas tree enough so that it doesn't become dry and crispy and drop needles all over the floor. Um, that never happens at my house. Do those things or are those things the type of things that bring you joy at Christmas? Well, we oftentimes equate those things with joy. We think of the wonderful things that happen this time of year as we are heading towards Christmas, uh, the family relations we have and the, the fun that we're going to have around the tree the night before if we're cheaters or the morning of Christmas when we're really supposed to open our gifts. And we get excited about those things. But those aren't uh, the type of joy that we're going to be talking about uh, today. We want to talk about a, a real joy, not a joy that's dependent on our human uh, circumstances, but a joy that's really dependent on our relationship with God. You know, uh, we light candles and we celebrate with songs and we do a lot of these things around Christmas time that, 
sort of get our heart revved up, you know. You get more and more uh, Christmassy as you get closer to the 25th. And for some of us, it's a very wonderful time. But for some, it can be a pretty depressing time. Uh, if, if you're alone and the, you don't feel like you have anybody or any family uh, to be with, um, it can be a tough time. Or if you're away from family, you know, you live in another country from your family or another state even, and you don't have the opportunity to be with them, <clears throat> it can be a tough time. Or maybe you've, you've lost somebody uh, close to you this year, and it can be a tough time to go through that first Christmas um, without them. But when we think about uh, joy, our joy as believers is not necessarily uh, or should not necessarily be influenced by those things. Because our joy is a joy that is different. And I think the difference that most people try to make is the difference between happiness and joy. You know, we can be really happy at Christmas. It doesn't mean that we have the joy of the Lord. Uh, we can be happy in our life, and it doesn't necessarily mean we have the joy of the Lord. I've known lots of people who are happy in their life, but they don't know Jesus. And so they live on that happiness, but it tends to be very... Uh, meteoric right they get really really happy over some things and then when when the world lets them down or a person lets them down or they let themselves down in some way they go crashing down to the bottom and there isn't that that sense of level in their life that the lord brings when he brings real joy and so today what we're going to be looking at is some passages in scripture that talk about the idea of joy and we're going to look at two reasons why we uh, get joy. Uh, we, it's, this is the best season to do that in, by the way. But we're going to look at those, how joy you know, shifts our, our situations. But we're also going to look at maybe the source of joy, the reason joy can be a constant in our life. So we've got a couple of verses here that I want to read with you. And we're going to start, I think, do we start with Isaiah? Yeah, we start with Isaiah. Let me find it. Well, you know what, I'll just read it off the screen because I didn't print the Isaiah verse uh, for myself. It says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his, of his oppressor has been broken as on the day of Midian. Go ahead. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us, you don't recognize this verse from Christmas, right? For to us a child is born, to us a child, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of the peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Now, a couple other verses I want to share with you, two or three, uh, come out of the New Testament. This is one, and the word, this is John 1, 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then Paul writes in Romans, but God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And in 1 John, John writes again, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. So mark those verses if you have them. Uh, in your notes, you can mark them and you can look at them as we go uh, through where we're talking about, and you can underline them and highlight them a as, we, as we go. We want to talk, first of all, about the fact that we can have joy because God came to us. That's the greatest thing about Christmas, right? That's the message. We don't want to skip that message of Christmas, and that is the joy that we have in our life, not that uneven happiness but that joy that is constant, regardless of our circumstances, isn't built on our circumstances, but rather built on God's provision. We can have joy because God came to us. A common misconception people carry around with them is that 
to be reunited with God in the right relationship with Him, we must earn His acceptance through good works. That we've got to do good things or be good people. One of the greatest joy robbers in our lives is thinking that we can never be good enough. That is a huge joy robber. That idea that I'm just not good enough. God could never uh, take me or want me. We're broken, we're flawed, we're hurt, we hurt others, we make mistakes, we live selfish lives. And if we're relying on our abilities to earn a connection with God, we will always, always, always be disappointed. If you're hoping that something you do gets you any higher status with the Lord, it, it isn't going to happen, right? I mean, let's, let's get to that truth first, that nothing I can do can earn my way to heaven. No, no person, no personality that I can have, nothing that I can be, right, will get me to heaven. There's only one way. I love the old Billy Graham uh, four spiritual laws that, that we shared with people years ago, the little paperback, uh, little uh, pamphlet that we would hand out. <clears throat> and in that pamphlet, it showed me on one side of the canyon and God on the other side of the canyon and this vast opening between us. And there's nothing that I could do, nothing I could say, no good person that I could be that could get me across that canyon. And then the illustration in the booklet is that Christ came and went to the cross for us. And so the, the cross is inserted in that canyon and the little stick figure can walk across that canyon on the cross. That's a great illustration because it really shows that there's no way that I can ever achieve heaven or a relationship with God on my own. It had to be done another way. And God sent His Son, Jesus. So we can have great joy, uh, a never-ending sense of contentment because of what God did in His plan by sending His Son. That should not only bring us joy, but it should sustain our joy. When I'm going through a difficult time, a, a Christmas on my own, or financial worries, or relational worries, or job worries, I can still have joy because I know I've got this communication, this relationship with God, and regardless of my circumstance, God is always there, and He's always there for me. And, you know, faith comes into this a little bit, right? It's, you've got to understand that your faith and, and uh, your, your trust in God is not going to be rebutted. God isn't going to turn away from you. And that is so difficult for us to handle. That's why we see friends who give their life to the Lord, who come to Christ at some point in their life, but then turn around and walk away. It's because they see, they see what's going on with God, and they go, well, I don't, I'm not living a good life, and I don't think God loves me, and so I'm just going to turn around and walk away. And the reality is that God, when He comes for us all, and we come to Him in great and new relationship, He never turns away from us. But the minute something goes wrong or something gets hard, we tend to look for another answer. God was great for a season, and now I'm just going to look for another answer. And there is no other answer. God is the answer. And through His Son Jesus, He provided an answer for us, a way, a way to have that relationship with Him. And so that can sustain us if we understand that no matter what we're going through, that we can have great joy because God came for us. This is the joy of Jesus. This is what Christ brings to us when He comes. That's why we celebrate this little baby at Christmas. It's the joy of God's forgiveness, of relationship. It's the joy of grace. It's the joy of love. It's the joy of God's mercy in our life. Matthew and Luke, they record Jesus' birth from similar perspectives. As John began his Gospel letter, he gave a different perspective on the birth of Jesus. Rather than tell us his, uh, you know, the, the iteration of shepherds and uh, magi and the manger, and he gives us this big picture explanation of what took place in Bethlehem. And John wrote, uh, what John wrote here is the cause of great joy for every believer. And this is what he says in John 1.14. And the Word, meaning Jesus, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, 
full of grace and truth. John wanted us to know right away what was the source of our joy as believers. It was because He came and dwelt among us in the flesh. Now think about that. Uh, if you were God or I was God, we would probably come up with a different plan. But God's plan was that Jesus would leave heaven where He had resided for eternity. He would put on the very flesh like He had created in the creation of the world or the creation of man. And He would come down and live among us. And He was still God. He's always been God. He'll always be God. But He lived among us, an imperfect, flawed group of people, and He Himself was perfect. And it wasn't that He just came among us to teach, although Jesus was a great teacher. It wasn't that He came to be a philosopher, although the philosophy of Jesus has changed the world over the centuries. It was He came to go to the cross. So when we celebrate this baby that came, and everybody loves a baby, He came as a, as a child to us to live in the flesh. But He came for a purpose. He came for the purpose of going to the cross for us. And Jesus went to the cross for you and for me that opened the door so that you and i might have a relationship with god that opened the door so that no matter what kind of person i am no matter what i've done in my life no matter where i live or what i wear or what i eat i can have a relationship with god through jesus christ that brings great joy it warms the heart of anyone who has come to christ for real right it doesn't matter whether you own everything in town and you're, you're the wealthiest person in the world, you know something's missing until you find Christ. You can be the lowliest of lowly. You can be a, a, a prisoner in a cell locked away alone in solitude and have nothing to your name, and yet you can have Christ. That brings great joy. We all come to that point in our life where we realize something is missing. I need something. And the beauty of Christ is that in His Word, He tells us He stands at the door and He knocks. And He will come in if you welcome Him. But so many turn away because there are so many flashy things to get our attention, to tell us that they can solve our problems and they can give us a good life. All you have to do is watch television and you'll realize that every commercial will tell you how to fix everything and you can fix it in 30 seconds. All you have to do is dial this number and send in some money. And you know, if it was that easy, it'd be awesome, wouldn't it? But it's not that easy. In fact, it's so difficult that it could only happen one way, and that was through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He can bring joy. And so we rejoice because He came to us to make a way. And my friend, listen, it, He is waiting for you right now. He's knocking on the door. He's saying, I want to come into your life. I want to be your Lord and your Savior. He wants to be yours. He wants to be yours. That, that's amazing to me because, you know, I, there are people that have done me wrong. I'm sure you've had people in your life that have done you wrong. And you thought, well, we were the best of friends or, or we, we loved one another in some sense. And, and now they've turned their back on me and I, you know, I, don't, I don't like them anymore. And they certainly don't like me anymore. And, and we live like that as people. It can sometimes be family, sometimes be friends, but I'll bet you everybody here has got somebody in their life like that. And, and God, who of, who of all creation, God who could have turned His back on us, who rightly in His perfectness, in His sinlessness, could have said, I don't want anything to do with these creations that, I, that I've brought about. I, I'm just going to get rid of them. Uh, he could have done that, but He didn't do that. He sent His Son to live like us, to show us what it meant to know God and to love God. How many of you buy bananas? You buy bananas? Eat bananas? Yeah. We buy bananas. We are overzealous banana buyers. I don't know if this fits you, but we are overzealous banana buyers. I like a, an almost green banana. Almost. Now, I like them really hard, right? And that's what I and my wife likes them a little softer. She likes them when they're yellow and they're really pretty and she peels them back and they just kind of go moosh in your mouth kind of thing. So, so different people have a different take on bananas. But our problem is we shop at Costco. I don't know, you probably shop at Costco. And you can't get like three bananas. you got to get like 12 bananas. 
And we'll put our bananas on our counter. And you know what? If I eat them within the first two days, they're that nice, hard, green. I love them. If my wife gets to them by day two, they're kind of yellow and they taste good and they're just squishing her mouth like they're supposed to. But man, if we leave those bananas three days, what happens? You know what happens because you do the same thing, right? They turn black. They get these, first they get these little small bruises, we like to call them. That's polite. They're just rotting is what's happening there. And these little tiny, tiny rotting spots and you think, oh, that's not like how I like them. So when you think of your choice of snack food, it's that or Cheetos, you go for the Cheetos because they don't have rotten spots. And, and a piece of fruit, it's got some. And so then you wait another day, right? And the next day, it's worse. The spots are bigger. If you wait as long as I do when my wife's out of town, they turn black. And the bananas just go bad. I mean, they're bad. If we save them in time, sometimes my wife will say, oh, I'll put them in the freezer. And I'll just make banana bread later on, right? That's one of the, one of the options. Uh, but, but for me, uh, after day two, they're no good anymore. Now think, now think about that with the Lord. When the Lord looks down on us over the, the drop of time that is the history of the world, when He looks down on us, He goes, man, those, those people I created, they went rotten fast. It only took a century or two. Well, you know, in, in the case of Adam and Eve, it was days, right? It's like, oh man, they lost it quick. And it didn't get just in there, right? As time goes on and the world goes on, uh, it gets worse. The biblical example is this. You know, we come out of the Garden of Eden where everything's perfect and we're meant to live forever. And what happens? We have, we have death that enters the world, so people die. But they don't die right away. People were living to hundreds of years old, right? I mean, there was just the little black spots of rotten that were in mankind. But eventually, over time, we get to where we are today, and we like to think that we're so much sophisticated and so much more uh, you know, adept at life and so much better than people back then. But the reality is, morally and ethically and in every other way, we're, rot- we're black rotten, right? We're just bruised all over. We're broken. And you couldn't even, you know how sometimes you peel a banana and it just goes mush? Yeah, that's us. We're in such need of, of God. And we're rotten. Now the joy comes in when we realize that Jesus came to live among us and to show us what a relationship with God is like. And he goes to the cross, not because he liked it. Uh, It's because he knew we needed it. And the scripture tells us, who for the joy set before him. In other words, he knew what was going to happen as a result of going to the cross, that people would be saved, that people would be brought back into relationship with God the Father, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross. We can have great joy because God came for us. He didn't abandon us. He didn't stick us in a freezer and say, I'll make banana bread. He said, hey, I've got to rescue my people. These are the people I created to have a relationship with. He wants to know you personally. And when we turn our back on Him, it's our own fault. He's pursuing us. The hounds of heaven are after us. And we just walk away. And what we need to realize is that He came so that we can know Him. It doesn't mean that life's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be a, you know, a, a straight walk. It's going to be difficult. But what it does mean is He loves us desperately. And He wants to have relationship with us. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So this passage about the Word becoming flesh gives us this wonderful uh, idea that God came for us. He comes for you. He comes for me. And it's a common misconception for us to think that it's something we have to do. It's nothing we have to do. He's standing at the door knocking. Can He come in? Because, my friend, that's what he wants to do today. That's what he wants to do in this season. And that's what you can share with those at work and those around you is, hey, I'm sustained by a God who wants to come in. He doesn't want to punish me. He doesn't want to live separate from me, but he wants to have a relationship with me. Consider it all joy, James said, when you encounter various struggles, knowing that the testing of your faith brings about perseverance. 
So that faith that we have in Christ Jesus, it doesn't necessarily mean life is going to be easy, but He's there with us. He's living with us in the midst of that. So joy is at the heart of Christmas because knowing that we could never make it to Him, God came to us. In Romans, again, Paul said, but God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, right? While we were going about our life sinning, He came for us. He died for us. Simply stated, the Christian faith reminds us that our fundamental problem is not moral, but rather spiritual. It's not just that we are immoral, but that a moral life alone cannot judge, or I should say bridge, uh, what separates us from God. Have you ever thought about that? A lot of people will tell you, but I'm a good person. I've never hurt anybody. I I don't get anybody in trouble i don't lie to anybody i'm a, i'm a very moral person that's that's my testimony i grew up in a very moral home my parents were wonderful people they taught me to say yes ma'am and yes sir and thank you and please and not to hurt anybody not to do anything wrong do no harm was kind of a mantra i suppose in our house but we didn't have any relationship with god and it wasn't until later in my life that i realized that morality is not going to get me anywhere I'm still going to be I'm still going to be a polite guy but I'm still going to have to face questions that we all face about our eternity. How do I change that? Well, I I love that what the psalmist says in Psalm 34, "Oh taste and see that Yahweh is good. How blessed is the man who takes refuge in him." And I can testify too that that's very true that my life has been very blessed. Not because of anything I do, not because of the job I have, not because of the family I have, although those are all wonderful blessings, but my, wife is ble- my life is blessed because of what my God has done for me. Because I put all those other things in the context of Jesus coming for me. And that brings great joy in my life. A joy that isn't, isn't meteoric, right? It doesn't come and go, it doesn't ebb and flow. It is a constant in my life. Because God brings that joy. The understanding of who God is brings that joy. In the presence of your fullness, the psalmist goes on to say, in in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. When Moses went to Pharaoh, he demanded that Pharaoh release all the enslaved uh, Hebrews. Not on a moral demand, but on a spiritual demand. In Exodus 1.8, Moses says, Let my people go that they may serve me. He's speaking on behalf of God. After they were finally released, they were led through the desert to enter the promised land. It wasn't easy for them. It wasn't a soft ride. In fact, many of them wanted to turn around and go back to Egypt where at least they could have three square meals a day. Had they never been led through the desert, they probably would not have come into the promised land that God had provided. What a wonderful archetype for our life. When we come to Christ... We are free indeed, doesn't mean that life is going to be easy. But the result of that freedom is we will get through our struggles because God will be leading us. And eventually we get to that promised land. What is our promised land? I love some of the old spiritual songs that are sung that sing about the idea of getting across to Canaan, right? The promised land. And people would sing that while they worked the fields. And they would sing that while they thought about higher things than what they were doing here on earth. And the idea is this, that we have a struggle in our life, but the joy in our life comes from the fact that God loves us and came to be with us and is with us in that struggle. And after that struggle comes the great reward, and our great reward is to have eternity with God. Did a funeral just uh, last week, and uh, one of the things I want to make sure people understood was the idea of making a decision about God is completely up to you. You get to choose whether or not you accept what Jesus did for you on the cross or deny it. And the thing is, is is when we uh, turn away from God, we oftentimes find ourselves when we're in that debate over heaven and hell, and we all have that in the quiet moments of our life. Where am I going to end up? What's going to be my eternity? How is it all going to end for me? And we begin to debate those things, and and nobody likes the idea of of hell as as it's painted in Dante's Inferno, right? It's sort of influenced the way we look at Scripture and we interpret hell and we think of flames and eternity of pain and all of that stuff, and that may very well exist. But for me, it's just a simple knowledge that hell will be that place where God is not. And even in this world, as bad as it is, we can look around and we can see evidence of God. We see it in His creation, Paul tells us. 
In fact, His creation alone should be enough, Paul says, to turn our hearts to God. But also we see in uh, the creation around us and the creation above us in the stars. We see it in, in the small, the creation of, of small things and the atoms that create. The, I mean, everything that God has done, it leaves evidence of Him. And so when we think about heaven and hell, we're not in heaven, surely, but at least we have evidences of God. You see in our world points of grace. We see people offering mercy. We, we see people sometimes in peace. Of course, we see the opposite as well, don't we? Where people want to attack, where people want to destroy, people want to tear down. And so we can kind of get a picture of what it's like, but imagine a place where there is no evidence of God, where He is absent from everything. And I, you can imagine that would be truly hell. So the joy that comes in my life is a joy that comes from God who loves me, who sends His Son for me. His Son dies on the cross for my sin. His, sin is raised, his Son is raised again on my part to conquer death. And so I'm left with this joy that means, hey, I'm going to have a, maybe not an easy life, but I'm going to get to the promised land. I'm going to make it to heaven. And that's the first thing we want to understand about joy and why we have this great joy at Christmas time, because this is the first advent of Christ, right? He came to the world as the Son of God, and He came as a babe, and we love that. But He'll come again. He'll come as a conquering warrior. He'll come again, and He will rescue all of His people, the church, and He will take us to be with Him. And I'm excited about that. Doesn't mean that life's easy now doesn't mean that it will be easy, but it does mean that I can lean on Him, I can trust Him, and He's waiting for that opportunity. He's knocking on the door. The second thing we want to remember about joy in the season of Christmas is that God loves us just as we are, and, and He loves us too much to just leave us that way. And every Christian here should be able to say amen to that. God loves me so much that He's not willing to leave me the way I am. Wouldn't it be something if he came and he said, okay, Tom, I came for you. Uh, you're a horrible sinner. I can't even really look upon you. But you accepted my son Jesus as your Savior, so now just go about your life and do what you were doing. No, that's not how God works. God works in a strange way. He calls us to himself, and in that call, there's a never-ending love for God that grows. Some of us who have been believers for a long time haven't grown much. In many years but he's he's wanting us to grow in relationship with him and so we love a God who loves us in return who who saves us from eternal death and he draws us to himself and he says hey you are too loved to be left the way you are I'm gonna help you change and that's how that's how my joy grows during this Christmas season my joy grows a little more than it did last Christmas season, and it grows a little more all the time because I realize that God, what God has done for me and how important that is in my life. He brings a great joy because He's welcomed me into His kingdom, but He grows me, and that brings about great joy that is a growing joy. That's why uh, for some of you who have who maybe aren't believers or you're very young believers, you look up to people who have been believers for a long time and you say to yourself, wow, I wish I could be like that. I want to be that confident in my Lord. I want to be that confident in God who loves me. I want to be that confident in, in Jesus and what He's doing in my life every day. You're not there yet. You haven't gotten to that point. But you know what? You can. You can grow in your relationship with God. You can change in relationship with God. I, I love the testimonies that people share. You know, there'll be a big tent revival meeting and somebody will come forward and they'll share this incredible testimony that they were just a rotten person and they gave their life to the Lord and bang, their life just turned around like that. Next thing you know, everything's good. Next thing you know, everything's going their way. But the reality is for most of us that when we come to Christ, we want to be able to say, I'm growing in Christ. He's growing me. My joy was this big, now my joy is this big because of what I've seen Him do over time in my life. That's the reality for most of us. I'm not saying you can't do it the other way. I'm just saying that for most of us, there's a, there's a, there's a, a race to be run and we're starting out maybe just today. And that race gets you know, further along and eventually you can see the finish line. Uh, my brother-in-law 
uh, Dan is in much better shape than I am. He's a year older than me. Yeah, I know. It's hard to believe. It's hard. But, but he's a year older than me, and he's in probably the top five or ten guys at his age uh, in the country in triathlon races. He's really good. He's been to the Ironman in Hawaii a dozen times. He's, he travels to France. He does you know, Ironmans all over the country to qualify to, to do those sorts of things. Anyway, he, uh, he's pretty strong. But it hasn't been easy. He's had multiple uh, things happen in his life that have made it difficult for him to uh, be a triathlete. Part, partly because he's just getting older, right? But when he started out, he had a bike that was so-so. And he ran in shoes that were meh. You know, you could call them running shoes. And, and he, he could have a decent time. You know, he would finish. But now, he's much better. He wears $300 shoes, and he's got a $10,000 bicycle, and he's sponsored by multiple Christian organizations that you know, help him get to places he needs to go to run these races and do these things, and it's phenomenal. He didn't start that way, folks. The first step was saying, I want to do this. The first step was saying, yeah, I, I think I can compete, and taking that step. The first step, I suppose you could say is, Oh, are we lighting an angel on fire there? The first step, sorry, I should have known that. The first step is he says, I'm going to go to the shoe store and I'm going to pick up some new shoes or I'm going to you know, get a different bike or I'm going to work towards something. That's the first step. In our, in our journey of joy, the first step is this. The first step is you've got to say, I want that. I want that. I want that more than I want anything else. I want to know God, and I want to grow in my joy. My brother-in-law, Dan, this last week was training. Uh, one, once, a couple of years ago, I want to say a couple of years ago, he was on his bicycle training in the, in the San Francisco area, out, out East Bay, and he's on a country road, and he hit some gravel going around a corner, and he went down, and he hit his hip. He had to have his hip replaced. He healed up from that. He keeps going. Uh, this last week, he was actually in a race, and he's Riding his bicycle, he had finished the two mile, two and a half mile swim. Now he's on the uh, 110 mile bicycle ride. Somewhere along that ride, somebody ran into him. His bike went down, and he broke his. What do they call that bone? That's your shoulder blade. He broke his shoulder blade, so he's healing, you know, with his arm like this. But is he is he going to stop running? No, he's going to get out there as soon as he heals up, and he's going to get going again, and he's going to be back in the race. So many believers, so many of us, we fall. We, we break a spiritual hip. We break a spiritual shoulder blade. And you know what we do? I'm done. I quit. It's over. And I don't think we want to do that. I think if we can stay in the race, I think we'll find the reason why these things happen to us ultimately, but we'll also grow stronger in all that we can do in our joyous relationship with God. We can grow through those things. We don't have to let them sideline us. So God says, hey, I love you, but I, and I love you so much, I don't want to leave you the way you are. I want you to grow in your relationship with me. Um, in, in this particular uh, case, I think we realize that we have to realize that God loves us so deeply. Uh, so deeply that he would send his son, and that is crucial. Um, the book of 1 John sort of expounds on that idea. 1 John 4 9 tells us, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. Right? It doesn't say so that we might live on our own the way we were doing what we were doing. That's not at all what God says. That we might live through him um, god gives us full truth full truth and the word for that in the in the greek is aletheia it just means straightforwardness um, reality revealed god gives us straightforward truth as we live in him it's not always easy it's not always simple but he wants us to live through christ jesus so the reason Jesus came to us and manifests His love among us is that He desires for us to find incredible joy in Him. 
in order for this to happen, it requires, it requires a gift of truth and grace. The only way we grow is truth and grace. Um, so I'm living my life, and I'm doing what I do, and every once in a while, God will poke his head in and say, Tom, here's the truth. And he'll point out a flaw in me, or he'll point out a struggle that I'm having. And he'll say, but you know what? My grace is sufficient. My grace it will do the trick. Here's the truth, Tom. You're not all that and a bag of chips. The grace part of it is, he'll help me. He'll help me adjust. He'll help me change to be more like his son, Jesus. So God loves us so much that he doesn't want to leave us in the state that he finds us. That's why he stands at your door and knocks. Because he wants in to help you become all that you can be in Christ Jesus. Now, I, I hinted at it a little bit, but this is our third point, and that is the reason for this great joy. The joy is, is simply a result of grace. Grace is a word that shows up in the church a lot, but that is, that's because it is the way in which we are able to live a life of joy. It's because of God's wonderful grace to us. Um, I remember times when I would be with my dad, and we'd be driving down the road, and he'd confront me on something, and and it would go something like this, you know, hey, bud, I love you, but that can never happen again. And, you know, I'm, I was always thankful for the opportunity to learn those lessons from my dad in that kind, kind way. Hey, man, that can never happen again. But I'm thankful that you had the opportunity to learn this lesson, son. Because I didn't learn it till I was maybe much older. And I'm glad you've had the opportunity to, to learn this lesson. I really thought, uh, you'd be angry about, more angry about this dad. And he would say something along the lines of, you know, I'm showing you grace. I'm giving you a chance. I'm giving you a shot, right? I'm giving you the opportunity. But the words that meant the most were the words that he would say, I forgive you. Um, out of my love for you, I forgive you. But this can't happen again. It may have been a white lie that I told. It may have been a chore that I forgot to do. It may have been a responsibility that I relegated to my younger sister who flubbed it up. It could have been anything, right? But my dad would say, hey, this can't happen again. I forgive you because of grace. You know, I, I'm going to give you another shot. And that's the same response that I get from my Father in heaven every time I approach him. He says, it's okay, Tom. My grace is sufficient. It's okay because my grace gets you over the hump. Not anything you can do, not anything you can say to apologize enough to me, but my grace will help. My grace will get you there. And so for us, I want us to consider today that idea of God's grace in our life. As He stands at the door and knocks for each one of us, it's a knock that sort of includes that idea of grace. God wants to offer that grace to us. That's why we have such great joy as believers. Because we depend on God's grace, and God's grace has never let us down. So this Christmas season, as you think about the baby that's coming, this first Advent, think about the wonderful grace, the truth, sometimes forgiveness, and grace that God offers. Because that grace will sustain your joy. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you so much for... Uh, how you care deeply for us and want us to be like your son Jesus. May we not be content with living uh, the same old, same old life, but as we think about the joy this season, may it include the knowledge that you came for us, that you love us, you care for us, you want relationship with us. And because of that, Lord Jesus, we can have a, a tremendous amount of grace and joy. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and join us as we're going to sing again? Streets to look upon the one.
one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. And there will be a day when I will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And every prayer we prayed in desperation, the songs of faith we sing through doubt and See that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears. And there will be a day when I will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no of the faith with one voice a thousand generations sing worthy is the lamb who was slain and on that day we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the A lot of churches across our country are praying, praying and preaching those same things today, and uh, and maybe some of them had their Advent 
thing catch fire, that we're not the only one. But the most important thing is that, well, I was kind of timing it so that it looked like smoke. It looked like the great and mighty Oz, right? But I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I missed it. I missed my opportunity. What we, what we don't want to miss is that he came for you and he came for me. And no matter what you've done, he wants to have a relationship with you. And he wants to lead you in a life of joy from this day forward. If you have any questions about that, I would love to sit and talk with you about it. Maybe talk about your journey. Let's pray together. Lord, as we go our way, make us confident in the joy that was brought with the baby Jesus. It marked that time in which you sent your son to be the penalty taker, to be the death overcomer on our behalf. What great joy that gives me. And I know that every day you're just knocking on my door saying, Tom, I've got more for you. And, and I pray for each person here that we would not let the door go unanswered, that we would seek you out. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, go out in the lobby, have some coffee, meet a friend, hang out, and talk about God's great joy. And if you guys would like to be part of one of those videos that we saw um, earlier today, we're going to be talking about love and God's love and how we've experienced that in our life. So if you want to be a part of that video, meet me in the fireside room and don't be camera shy. <laughs>